Okay, we are going to call the meeting to order at 6.01. And we will start out, let me get my agenda yeah. back up. Is that how we always start? Yep, Pledge of yes. Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance, the flag's out one. Like this. Oh, hey. We have one this time. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So much easier than it is on Zoom. Uh, okay, adjustments. I don't see any on the agenda. We don't have any right now. No. Uh, approval of minutes. I will make a motion to approve the minutes from February 1st, 2021, budget workshop at 4 p.m. February 3rd, 2021, budget workshop at 4 p.m. February 8th, 2021, budget workshop at 4 p.m. And February 8th, 2021, regular meeting at 6 p.m. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Paula. No. Any discussion? Yeah, no, on those couple of the meetings, and I don't remember which ones I was not at. You were not at? Yes. Okay, so hey, Matt, any ones that John wasn't at, just have him abstain from the vote. All in favor? All in favor. John approves the ones that he was actually at. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to say, well, I know it wasn't one of those. Which one was it? Uh, okay, so that's the minutes. Next section we have is public comment. Do we have anybody on that would like to make a public comment? John, I do. Is there anybody from the public comment? I see a couple of folks on, but it doesn't appear that anybody wants to. So go right ahead, Mr. Babes. So two weeks ago at one of our meetings, or at, the, at, that, at that meeting, I made a comment that I'd like to apologize for. It was it had unintended consequences. After talking to the superintendent, my intent uh, was a little different than the impact it may have had on staff. <clears throat> I, I personally put in many hours to help our schools. Uh, my intent was an aggressive approach towards more help, quite frankly. Parents want the kids back in school. Parents are equally frustrated as staff. Uh, we, the school committee, volunteer to make our community better. We, and COVID-19 deserves our collective respect. Um, school committee did make suggestive comments to the reopening of our schools. And I do believe the topic did need to be front and center and uh, the betterment of our children. Uh, my comment was unacceptable. And for that, I offer genuine apologize, apology. Uh, I, too, am frustrated with pandemic and what's causing all of our lives to be a little bit upside down. So I just wanted to share that with all of you publicly. Great. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, as always, I think everybody in this room holds uh, the entire staff of the school department in the highest esteem. And maybe we haven't told them how much of an incredible job they've done the last year, but they really have. I think everybody has. Parents have. The kids have stepped up. It's been tough on everybody. Everybody's kind of at that breaking point. Hopefully we're coming out of it and spring into summer, we'll see things changing. So, Summer's coming. Uh, okay, uh, one last call for anybody on Zoom that wanted to make a public comment. Doesn't look like it, so we're gonna move on. Uh, next section is communications. Uh, Matt, do we have anything there? I see none. Nope. Okay, um, I will under here note that we have gotten I don't know, it seems like every day we have a couple of emails from parents uh, in favor of getting the kids back in school more. Um, it's been, I thought it was gonna dry up, but it seems like it's a pretty steady stream. It's almost like every day or two. Um, this is a time when I think the school committee finds itself truly in in the middle of a tug of war. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm not sure if there's a, I don't know who wins in this. I don't think there are. We know I, we just I do the best we can. This is somebody's going to be upset either way. There is no winner, but at the end of the day, we're all in it together, and we all have to throw the boat in the right direction and do what's right for everybody, all stakeholders. Attempt to, yep. Well, we all have the same goal. We, our goal okay. is what's best for the kids and their education and their overall well being. Yeah, so if we can keep that in mind, hopefully, we can all uh, kind of walk in each other's shoes and be kind to one another, and we'll get through this. Right. 
Uh, okay, committee reports. Uh, Mr. Nelson, construction updates. Floor is yours. Thanks, Don. I'll start with the high school technical center. We are making progress. We did receive the latest balancing report. The welding shop dust collections finally adjusted to within the uh, accepted percentage of the design. So that's good news. I would say overall from the balancing report, it's uh, probably, uh, as I talked with the architect, uh, looked at as about 90% done. We just need to get it to the finish line. There's a few of the areas that have not balanced. Um, those include the kitchen and locker rooms. Um, so all we need is adjustments and corrections. Um, the architect feels that it's not a design issue. We just need to get the subcontractor to come in and make the changes that need to be made. Um, last week, uh, being the uh, school vacation week, we did have some of our subcontractors who were out on vacation last week as well. Um, so they um, felt bad about not being able to be available last week and they'll be working with us this week so that we can continue to be able to try to get that um, adjusted and taken care of. Um, I, at the last school committee meeting, I did talk about how uh, we had a mediation uh, scheduled for construction um, between the school department and uh, the school department and the DOE um, against one of the subcontractors. Uh, so I wanted to share an update on that because um, in 2020, Warren Mechanical filed a complaint in York County Superior Court against uh, the contractor. And the complaint alleges that Warren is entitled to extra compensation on the Sanford High School and Sanford Regional Technical Center project on two items, thermal expansion loops on the hot water system for a total of $70,676 and also control wiring for the dust control system for $30,938, bringing the total claim to just over 100,000 at 101,614. So during the project, our uh, architect and their engineering consultant recommended that the request for extra compensation be denied because both items were not extra, but they were included as part of the Warren Mechanical's contractual scope of work. So basically the gist of Warren's claim is that the architect and the engineering consultant's plans and specifications did not make clear that the expansion loops and the dust control wiring were required to be installed by Warren. Uh, Warren's lawsuit also demands payment of retainage to, the, to Warren for $60,000, um, but retainage will not be uh, released uh, and it's not due until the punch list is complete, which for us, that punch list is not complete. So um, on February 9th, as I mentioned, we participated in mediation with Hutter and Warren. Uh, we also had representatives from the architect and the engineering firm, along with their attorneys, joined us uh, to provide additional information and support. Uh, Warren took the position that it had communicated its demand for the 101,614 and was unwilling to lower that demand without a counter offer from the Sanford School Department. So the mediator pushed us to make some sort of offer to get the settlement going. So we made a very small offer with several contingencies, which those contingencies included finishing the outstanding uh, mechanical punch list items and fixing the freeze trip issues um, by the middle of March. And so um, uh, with that, the um, Warren, uh, they reduced their demand just down to 100,000 and through their mediator, uh, we attempted to push Warren to make a significant move uh, to keep the mediation going, but they refused and instead they actually made a take it or leave it offer uh, to us of a payment of $100,000. And so we, um, and that they would waive their claim for retainage and their involvement in the project would end even though they wouldn't complete their punch list items. So that was very disappointing uh, response. And so in essence, the mediation ended. Um, and so uh, I think it is worth noting that the contractor was unwilling to contribute any sum towards the settlement. And so likewise, our architect and engineering consultants were not willing, at least at this point, to also contribute towards a settlement. 
So within days of that mediation ending, the contractor did file a motion in Superior Court to add the school department and the architect as parties to Warren Mechanical's lawsuit. And our legal counsel feels that that motion is likely to be granted, at which point the Sanford School Department will file a motion to stay the court case and move it to arbitration. So um, disappointing as we were hoping to kind of make some uh, progress with that. We still feel our case is really strong uh, as you work at the documents that we work through the Department of Education. So uh, that is the latest update on the mediation uh, back from February 9th. Are there any uh, questions on um, the high school technical center instruction update? Doesn't look like any, Matt. Thanks. So at Converted Elementary School for phase one, area A, the upper, that's the uh, kindergarten wing, that's 99% framing is completed. The drywall's in progress. The electrical and the plumbing systems are being inspected and the duct work is completed. Phase two, uh, which is up by the library, uh, the upper B and uh, lower, the framing is ongoing. The slab infills have been poured and mostly completed. The duct work is completed. Phase three, which is the lower level uh, over uh, near uh, Memorial Gym, that underground work is ongoing and the concrete is being placed. Uh, we had a review of the old automotive slabs that were found to have some toppings and oils that are being removed in order to uh, re-level and provide new VCT. This was discovered after the abatement of the old flooring. And this is the resulting of some extra scopes of work and some extra costs to remove that topping and oil, as well as re-leveling of the floor. Um, the removal of the carpet in the library determined that the existing floor is painted. And so that's not ideal for the bonding of the new carpets. And um, modern adhesives are not as forgiving as the old products. So the contractor's pricing what it will cost us to remove the paint versus risking warranty of new carpet being adhered to painted slabs. Uh, we have seen the pricing for the Area A electrical corrections needed, uh, identified after the ceilings were removed. That cost is just under $30,000, and we feel that's reasonable for the work identified. Um, the architect is working towards issuing the proposal for the electrical fixes in Area B. We should be getting that um, early this week. And they're planning their visit to Area C once all the ceilings have been removed. The architect is continuing to finalize some of the owner requested scopes. Uh, the remaining PRs are all for new ceilings and light stage curtain replacement in the lower entry soffit replacement. Our, our contractor has not reported any delays or disputes at this time. They've billed about 30% of the project scope to date. We have our next construction meeting this Thursday. For the uh, Sanford Middle School project, um, the architects received the owner's manuals and they're currently reviewing those. We did release some of the retainage. Uh, the balance remaining now is approximately just over $100,000 at 113,000. Some remaining work is to fix at the kitchen floor tile and placing the correct flooring uh, in the OT and PT spaces. And right now, uh, the contractor will be scheduling that work around school being in session or actually being out of session so the work can get done. And um, the um, floor coat lean has yet to be released. And right now, our contractor uh, reports that they plan to pull the bond that they have pulled out for the subcontractor. So that's an update on uh, elementary and middle. Any questions for that? Safe to assume it's uh, still on uh, target for opening? Yep, that's right now. Um, that's what we're being reported. As I said, our next construction meeting is this Thursday. I never want to ask that question. I'm always nervous. I know. Yeah, Amy? I mean, I, I'm not a, um, a contractor or a painter, but it seems it seems a little excessive to have to remove the paint that's been under that carpet for what 20 plus years especially knowing that bookcases and all heavy heavy stuff is going to go right back on new carpet i don't know to me it seems a little over just 
over excess, I guess that's not really the word I'm trying to say, but you know, to try to have to remove it just seems like extra time, extra cost. I mean, if they really want the adhesive is not going to then just maybe remove the paint from the outer um, from the wall. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it just yeah. seems a little bit like if they, it's been that way for that long, I don't know why that would be really be a, something that has to be done. Well, right now we're just not, they, they won't warranty their work. And so that's what's driving the big piece of it is based on, um, even though it worked fine uh, for what it was now, as you put it down for the new and whatever is new is coming down, they will not be able to put the uh, put a warranty behind that. So is they, are they gonna cover the cost of removing the paint or is that an excess cost? That looks to be an excess cost. It's been the wonderful world of construction all along. Mm -hmm. Well, right that's now, not, what we, we haven't made a decision on that. The contractor is pricing that out right now, what it'll be. And that's something for us that we're going to have to look at to say, what is that cost versus uh, risking not having the warranty? Yeah, and that'll come back through the, uh, the construction committee on that, right. the building committee, right, Matt? Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments on elementary? Oh, looks like we're good to move on, Matt. Well, that's it for the construction report. There is. Okay. Sorry, I just got my agenda open again. Uh, SPAC, do we have anything for the Performing Arts Committee? Uh, oh, you're all good? Yeah. Uh, WSSR, did we end up having a meeting on Wednesday? No, we didn't actually. <laughs> Ian and yeah. I talked for a while, but there wasn't a meeting. I gotta, uh, I'll, I'll step up and say I totally dropped the ball on having a meeting last week for WSSR. I had a lot of stuff going on at work, and I think Paula texted me at like noon on yeah. Wednesday and said, hey, are we having a Zoom this afternoon? So we'll, uh, we'll get that back on track. I don't know if we really had that much to talk about anyway, so but we'll get stuff rolling. Um, adult Ed, anything you'd like to add there? Uh, I would. In a, in, a, in a recent communique with, with uh, Nicole Ivey, she just uh, telling us that they're preparing for a spring semester, so the intake is happening uh, this week. Spring brochure should be in the mailboxes by March 15th. Uh, and she says, most importantly, they're, they're, they're diligently working on a driver ed program. Um, driver ed programs are, there's, there's a, a backlog because of COVID. And they were thinking about a driver program anyway, and maybe subsidized, um, mm -hmm. but not, I, don't, I shouldn't, shouldn't overemphasize subsidized. Um, but again, the, the issue with, with driver training is uh, an instructor. She thought she had somebody who was interested, but again, COVID plays a role there. So they do uh, want to add a driver aid program. So. That's great. That's the kind of stuff I think that's happening in adult ed right now that's exciting. She's really kind of reaching out and looking for what the community needs and yep. making it happen. Yep. Right, anything else? No, that's it. No. Okay, so if you're watching right now and you're a driver, a certified driver's ed instructor, and you want to work at Adult Ed, okay. give them a call. Uh, okay, Matt, superintendent's report. Actually, we're going to start out with the student reps. Uh, I saw Juliana was on. Uh, do you have anything to share with us tonight? I do not have anything to share tonight. Sorry. No problem. Um, I did actually get an email from Grace. Uh, she has basketball and volleyball practice today, but she wanted me to. Uh, did it, oh, she wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Peterman, Mr. Tremley, and Mr. Watts. Uh, they worked the forklifts at the community distribution at the high school, uh, the food distribution last Thursday. Uh, they unloaded 75,000 pounds of food. Uh, Mr. Peterman saw the project through to the end, helped clean up in the dark, and helped move the uh, wood pallets away afterwards. Uh, it was a great day. Apparently over 100,000 pounds of food went out to the community, helping over 12,000 families. That's so spectacular. Yeah, that's awesome. So, And once again, huge shout out to uh, Mr. Peterman, Mr. Tremley, and Mr. Watts for being there and helping out. And so, all the volunteers that went, I heard it was like really, really, really cold that day, and they yeah. were there for hours and hours. So thank you to all the volunteers that went and helped as well. Everybody involved. That's awesome. So, and Grace, thanks for dropping the, the email and, and me for remembering to actually bring it up. <laughs> Change a little bit there. Oh, what's going on? I think that's Matt. That's not me. 
or whoever's got the four days a week requesting. Um, okay, so that's it for um, the student reps. So Matt, the floor is yours. Well, I think a nice segue would be also uh, congratulations to Grace Davey, uh, one of our school committee uh, student reps, because she was one of two recipients in the state named Maine's top youth volunteer of 2021. And so as a state honoree, Grace is going to receive a $2,500 scholarship, uh, a silver medallion, and an invitation to the program's virtual national recognition celebration in April where 10 of the 102 state honorees will be named America's top youth volunteers of the year. And so Grace's work with the backpack program was instrumental in her receiving this award. So kudos. I know Grace is busy with basketball and volleyball tonight, but kudos to Grace, uh, not only for the successful uh, food distribution we talked about, but uh, all of her work in general and for being recognized with that award. Excellent. Good job, Grace. Okay, so for a um, COVID update, a uh, couple things. Prior to school vacation, York County was removed from the yellow designation to a green designation. The next update will be this coming Friday, but it does appear that we are definitely trending in the right direction. Um, so last week was school vacation, obviously, uh, with our schools closed down. We did receive report today that there were seven individuals who tested positive for COVID-19 over the school vacation. But since it was over school vacation, there is no uh, contract tasting that is necessary. And so uh, our total positive cases right now in the school department is at about 149. From an athletic standpoint, if you remember, we did um, uh, begin athletics our, uh, for basketball um, and cheering. The boys' ba uh, basketball has started, but our boys' basketball uh, team, unfortunately, is currently in quarantine. They ran into a situation where uh, the opponent that they played last uh, Wednesday, uh, someone tested positive uh, from that team that has put them into quarantine. Also our wrestling team uh, still uh, has not got the green light to compete for wrestling. So they'll continuing to work out um, in, on their conditioning. Uh, we did release a, um, we did release a survey uh, to find out interest in families, um, the, interested in increasing from two days of in-person learning to four days of in-person learning a week. And so uh, kudos to uh, Beth Lambert. She worked on creating an ad hoc group uh, that was allowing us to send out that uh, survey to the families who are currently attending two days a week. Uh, but when we did release that survey initially, we did not include the information with the link or any explanation there. And so that uh, information was uh, also forwarded out to people uh, beyond that ad hoc group who it was intended for. So we did re-release the survey a week ago Friday with that explanation um, for it. And um, so that was, we've got great feedback uh, on that. I did send that, the deadline for that survey is today. So I did send out a reminder um, for that um, last night or yesterday. And so we had, I think uh, Beth was telling me today, we had over 300 responses um, for that just after yesterday, uh, just after that announcement. And so uh, kudos to Beth Lambert and Andler. They worked hard to really go through that survey <clears throat> because we did have in some situations, some people who, um, uh, may already have been attending for four days a week, may have already completed it. We may have also had some people who uh, no longer attend the Sanford School Department complete it. Um, and we may, we had a lot of duplicates uh, for that. So um, uh, Beth worked hard to try to be able to um, give us the latest update regarding understanding that the survey is also not um, it is also not um, finished yet because the deadline is today. So I did want to provide an update uh, to people on where we sit um, for that. 
So uh, as you look at Carl J. Land School, um, we, these are the survey requests that we did that we did receive for people to attend four days a week. So we had 52 kindergarten students, uh, 36 grade one students, 36 grades two students, uh, 25 grade three students, and 28 grade four students. That number in parentheses, those are the total number of people who would be attending uh, at Carl J. Lamb for four, uh, that would be uh, attending for four days a week. Uh, at uh, Willard, uh, hold on here, at Margaret Chase Smith School, we had 44 kindergartners, 33 grade one students, 37 grade two students, 22 grade three students, and 26 grade four students. Those numbers in parentheses would be the total number of kids who would be attending four days a week uh, in those situations at Margaret Chase Smith School. Next, we have Willard School, uh, 28 people for grade one, 13 for grade two, 16 for grade three, 20 for grade four. And in parentheses, you'll see the total uh, 40 for grade one, 39 for grade two, 37 for grade three, and 49 for grade four. At the middle school, we had 83 fifth graders, 76 graders, 81 seventh graders, and 79 eighth graders. And then those numbers uh, in parentheses are the total that would be going uh, four days a week. And then at the high school, we had 64 ninth graders, 42 10th graders, 36 11th graders, 41 12th graders. And then in parentheses would be those students who are attending, um, who would be the total number uh, interested in returning for four days. So now uh, we have that information. So now we can start working with um, admin school administration. So we can start now looking at uh, those classes and those spaces, assigning those students. We want to make sure that we've got uh, what is needed to safely accommodate the four person, the four day of in person learning uh, with that. Um, also, obviously, the spacing will be important with that to make sure that the number of kids, because uh, it varies from class to class. Our goal here is to be able to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, work towards that, accommodating that safely. Uh, we have ordered some more PPE. We have ordered more desks. We are looking at um, working at uh, making sure we can adhere to the lunch guidelines for that. So um, it was a good survey results that we've received and we are being able to work on that now of taking the next step uh, to be able to see where we can plug those people in and if we can come back and be able to do that safely or are we going to have to move spaces or change areas for that. We still have concerns about um, staffing. Uh, when you look at space, a reminder that the space is a guideline of three to six feet, three feet for students, but for our staff, uh, it has to be uh, six feet for that. And then with lunches right now, we are limited to having uh, lunch spaces capped off at 50 people um, for that. So uh, based on where we are uh, in our attempt to look at trying to increase the in-person learning, We'll continue to be working towards that and see if we can continue to do it safely. Are there any questions on that from the school committee? Questions? Yes. Oh, Amy, there we go. Uh, this is great. Thank you, Beth, for doing this and that. Um, so with the when with the elementary, um, with when you say like kindergarten, um, right? So how many classrooms would that be? Does that 72 include? Is that three kindergarten classes, four kindergarten classes? Yeah, so at Carl J. Lamb at kindergarten, that'd be six kindergarten classes, four first grade, four second grade, three third grade, and three fourth grade. And is it the same for MCS and Willard? Essentially, Margaret Chase, Margaret Chase Smith, you'd have five uh, kindergarten classes, five grade one classes, three grade two classes, four grade three classes, and four grade four classes. 
And then for Willard, you would have uh, three grade one classes, three grade two classes, three grade three classes, and four grade four classes. And then for grade five, that would be 10, you'd have 10 grade five classrooms. Grade six, seven, and eight use uh, more of a teaming approach, but there's still in essence, 10 teachers uh, assigned to those grade levels. Does that help, Amy? Yeah, it does, thank you. And then did, um, did any families with kids with um, in special ed that potentially well, would are in a, uh, a self-contained room that were potentially only, I know of one family that the child goes two days a week, um, Is there any data or is it? The, the, the majority of our special ed, uh, you're right, Amy, the majority of our special ed students were already attending four days a week, but there were some who weren't, who chose two. Uh, I'm not sure we've got to that level yet to be able to, to dig down into that, to be able to see uh, about that yet. These are just assigned to the grade levels that we have. That's the work that we have to do to start digging in there and now seeing what that's gonna mean. Okay. Say, Matt, now that you have um, kind of these rough numbers for the, the, I don't know, demand, I guess, would be the best word for it. Um, how about busing? Is that going to have an impact on busing? Have you guys looked at that yet? Or yeah, we've had, just... uh, yeah, Steve's had preliminary conversations with Ledgemere right now. Um, so I think, uh, as they were looking at ridership numbers ahead of this, we, we haven't got to that level yet. It's some of the, uh, requests that we have, we might've had multiple requests where, um, one, both parents may have, uh, uh, completed the survey for their child. And in some situations, one parent might've said no transportation needed. The other one said, yes. So we've got to dig into that further. I know Steve has had preliminary conversations with them. Um, right now, the, um, the uh, recommendation that's been given is uh, trying to keep buses at 26, but that is just a recommendation. That is not a guideline. So we're going to continue to be able to kind of look at what we've got as we put this puzzle together to see exactly, are we going to have situations where we can, um, safely transport people for it. Gotcha, thanks, Matt. Any other questions, comments from anybody on this, Amy? Um, so, it had, this is just an idea, um, you know, just kind of thinking about, you know, moving forward, at, you know, with the, um, the data that you got from the survey, it has there, is there a way to maybe see if there's any um, grades or teachers um, that would be willing to maybe pilot, um, you know, bringing back their class, their, their students in their classroom and kind of maybe piloting to kind of work the kinks out? Um, I know that where I work, we do tend to have one or two units piloting and then before we start going everywhere. And I, it's just something I thought about. Um, no, we haven't had any discussions, Amy, yet on piloting yet. I think we're still matching up the data to see exactly what we've got for um, interest and where spaces are. We do have some concerns that I think uh, some of those grade levels there might be, it might be tight. Some of the other grade levels, uh, the numbers uh, on the surface, at least before we start plugging them in to see where their individual classrooms are. Because remember, we want to, we want those kids assigned to their teacher. Um, we don't want them to have to change teachers. So we're going to have to wait and see what, how that, all of that shakes out. But we have not talked about anything yet as far as a pilot uh, for bringing people back at this time. Anything else? Anybody? No. No. Good to see you. But thanks for the update, Matt. 
Yeah, and we'll continue. We're working towards this. Uh, we have a meeting next Monday, our next meeting, and we'll continue to provide another update to share where we are in, in this um, process. Matt, can you send us that? Any chance we can get that? Yep, yep. Thank you. And, and remember, the, the survey is still open. So with, right now, we still could be getting some in. This is, uh, once again, kudos to Beth um, for going through at this level to be able to pull those out, to be able to, to, to have them come down because there were more. But as I said, there were situations where there were duplicates or there were people that don't even live in Sanford anymore um, for it. John, John, you want that now or the completed one? The, well, the completed one or to work the mo to work in motion, just so I could just digest it. Yep. It would um, be interesting school setting and in the middle school setting in the sense of like more like seventh, eighth, ninth through twelfth grade about kids who are hybrid or for whatever reason are allowed to go four days a week because of their <coughs> IEPs or, or whatnot. Um, if they're actually attending, you know, all the days, um, you know, and I, I know that that would be difficult to get that data, but it would be interesting. I'm sure the homeroom teachers could say, I'm, you know, I've got 10 that are supposed to be here four days a week or two days a week, but really only four are showing up or six are showing up on a consistent um, level. It would be interesting, you know, to know those numbers. Um, Okay. Yep. Okay. Anything else on that? <coughs> okay. What else do you have for your Matt? I have some other reports, but one of the things I did want to uh, uh, add to my superintendent's report tonight was the um, elementary school naming committee uh, that both um, that I was part of, but also um, Paula and Amy as school committee members were. So uh, a lot of great work has been done there. So I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Amy and Paula if they kind of want to report out to share with the school committee, uh, give us an update on that work. Sure. So we met um, we met twice. Um, it was uh, Mr. Nelson, Kendra um, Williams, former school board member, Paula Oji, a teacher at the high school. Um, Paula and I, and then Ann Hanselman and Bob Stack pulled who are um, city councilmen. Um, and so that's been who's been attending the meetings. Um, the survey was sent out community wide um, to thousands and thousands of people, including families within the school district twice, um, all over social media, as well as being forwarded to um, community um, groups such as Trapton Center, the YMCA, um, the PTAs, um, Golden Alumni. I know I'm missing some, um, but we had, there was quite the spreadsheet um, and we all tackled different community um, groups to get it out for those who, you know, may or may not have um, access to electronic, but we had asked groups to kind of help us out and um, offer for a two week window for those to be mailed to us if people, uh, for whatever reason, don't use the computer. So we got um, 454 votes. Um, 256 of those votes were for a person and 198 of those were for a place or a thing. Um, I'm going to read off, um, I'm not going to read off all 454 votes, but I'm going to tell you the top five. Um, the top suggestions for a person were um, in order, Margaret Murray, um, Sharon, Sharon, Sharon Remick, um, Alan Mapes, Brian Flanagan, and Joyce and George Willard. Um, and then for place and thing, there um, was a bunch of variations. So we kind of, uh, there are a bunch of variations of Spartan Elementary or Sanford Elementary. So we kind of like the idea of Spartan Pride Elementary or Sanford Pride Elementary. Um, there was also um, a top one of the Mouse Valley Elementary or some variation of that. Um, then there was Central Elementary School and Main Street Elementary School. Um, so, you know, basically the job of um, the committee was to gather the data, which we did um, 
in many different avenues and then bring it to the school board. And then from here, we'll decide if these are um, enough names for us to make a decision and go from there. Yeah, I think you guys did a great job. Um, especially, I think I see Paul's up on the Zoom. Your uh, multiple, multiple pages of uh, bio yeah. info yeah. was very interesting. I think maybe we should publish that as a coffee table book. <laughs> the uh, who's who in Sanford history. I mean, <laughs> and, and Paul did, you must have done hours and hours of putting that all together. So thank you so much for that, as well as Ann. Ann had done all the data as well. So it was um, definitely because of the two of you why we got um, so much information. So thank you. And can I say something, Paul? I do want you to know I did read a lot of it. And <laughs> as it was, I found myself captivated to just keep going. So thank you. You burned about two hours of my morning last week. <laughs> well, it, it's wonderful for anybody to see. You know, it, it, that's just a really a partial list of the outstanding people we have and have had in town. And the town's full of them, you know, and I think I mentioned before, this is one of the best problems that um, a city and a school committee could ever have is goodness. What are we going to name a new building? You know, we have so many great possibilities. So uh, I'm happy to help any way I can and we'll see what happens. Well, I think going forward from here, I think, um, you know, as far as I don't know, disagree, but I think you guys pulled in some good information. I think maybe next week on the agenda, we have it as an agenda item and we try to put it to bed. Um, sound yep. good to everybody? Yep. yep. So just once again, thanks to everybody on the committee for putting the time in. Um, and Paul, I think all your bio stuff probably isn't going to go away. So even if we don't use the names now, there's lots of new places in these buildings to put plaques up for people. So. <laughs> I have to get a, get a short list of a few people to put plaques up for, if nothing else. So. For sure. Okay, Thank great. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to mention on that, Matt, or does that sound good for now? No, I think we were, uh, once again, I just want to reiterate what, what uh, Amy and, and Paul have shared, uh, the great work of the committee between Paul and, and, and Ann putting that information together. I, too, enjoyed uh, researching that and, and reading that. So I think uh, we're well positioned now to help uh, the school committee uh, be able to make, a, at least have it as an agenda item next Monday to make a decision um, for that. So that's what we'll plan to do. We will plan to add it to next Monday night's agenda uh, as the naming of the uh, converted elementary school. Excellent, thanks. Anything else under your report, Matt? Uh, just a few things. Uh, I have been invited to participate on the city's cable franchise committee that Steve Buck established to assist in negotiating a new agreement uh, with Comcast. We had our first meeting last Wednesday. Um, the Thursday before vacation, we did have a, um, a fire at the MCS school by the propane tanks uh, with that. It was at such that uh, we were able to get um, partial heat to the building so the pipes wouldn't freeze overnight, but we weren't able to install the new part uh, until that following Friday and the heat was below uh, 50 degrees so the pipes didn't freeze. So I did have to cancel school at Margaret Chase Smith School the Friday before vacation uh, due to that, but things are all in working good order now um, for that. I also wanted to um, Give I probably should have done this in the uh, WSSR TV advisory committee, but another shout out to Sarah Schnell. She's been working very hard, hard um, um, in providing content for us, but she's really done the live streaming for those for our basketball games with those. The games are streamed, uh, the home games to the WSSR TV's YouTube channel with that. So if people want the complete schedule and the links to the games, they can go to the Sanford High School athletic page uh, for that. But a big thank you to um, uh, Sarah for that. Also, our uh, Director of Facility and Maintenance, Don Nichols, um, unfortunately uh, fell and broke his ankle in a couple of places this past weekend. Uh, so we moved uh, quickly to get his um, hire an assistant facilities director. That nomination will be coming up to next Monday's school committee meeting. 
and then um, also I wanted to announce um, that uh, Sanford's got talent. Uh, if you know that, that's usually the talent show that happens at Sanford Middle School every year, um, sponsored by the uh, JMG program. And so this year, their Sanford's Got Talent is going virtual, and they are doing a, um, they're accepting one minute videos showing us your best dance moves. So you can recreate your favorite TikTok dance or combine a talent with a dance. But either way, they're hoping to get people moving. So staff and students at the middle school are welcome to participate. Uh, I know that's unfortunate because I'm sure our school committee would have liked to have shown off their dance moves, uh, but that is something that is coming up um, for that. The top three videos with the most votes are going to receive gift cards for their favorite Sanford store. So that's um, kudos to JMG and still adjusting to the um, pandemic by having uh, the Sanford's Got Talent going virtual. And that is my report. But just to clarify, Jonathan can't put a submission in. He kind of what you wanted me to ask for him. I'm still an injured reserve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Matt. Um, let's move on to the director's reports. And Steve, the presentation we've all been waiting for, PEPG. Hey, Matt, can you share the screen? Uh, yeah, just a second here. Okay, can you see my screen now, guys? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Sanford uh, School Department Professional Edu Evaluation Professional Growth System, um, which we here in the department know as PEPG. Um, we also have a system that is in place as well that also for our administrators and that's called the Leadership Evaluation System tonight. But tonight I'm gonna to talk about the system that's in place for anybody that is on a teacher contract. So this involves teachers, guidance counselors, our school nurses, um, a whole um, crew of people that this system um, falls under. As we look at um, our PEPG system, um, we work, this quote really sums up um, why we have it in place. Um, systematic changes to standards, curricula, instructional practices, and assessment will achieve little if efforts are not made to ensure that every learner has access to highly effective teachers and school leaders. It's really the teachers that are in the classroom that make the magic happen, um, that do the great work with students. Um, and we really um, need to pay attention to the people that we have in uh, front of our classrooms. So as we look at the purpose for our system, it's really to encourage a shared language around the craft of teaching and to support collaboration amongst teachers across schools. Um, it's built to um, provide continuous improvement for teachers, to support and enhance teacher knowledge and performance, to promote teacher efficacy and a culture of professionalism, um, to promote increased communication about teaching and learning, um, serves as an indicator of performance and accountability, and it provides us with information as management to make decisions. Um, when we look to make decisions, we use our system for areas to provide professional development. We also look for areas to celebrate um, folks that are doing well, and then also look for um, areas where folks may need to have some improvement. To give you a little bit of background on the PEPG system, um, Sanford is all, has had a um, system in place for teacher evaluation for as long as I have been here. And in looking in some files, it goes back many, many years. So we've always had a system of teacher evaluation in place. But back in um, 2012, the state of Maine um, enacted a law, LD 1858, which um, 
developed a system for teacher and administrator evaluation. Once that law went into place, the um, rules that govern the law were written and we call those chapter 180. And soon after that, the Sanford PEG, PEG committee was established to develop the system here in Sanford. Um, that committee was made up of teachers, administrators. Um, I, I believe at the time there were a couple of school committee members also who participated on that initial committee um, with that. Throughout the school year in 2015-2016, we worked to develop the system. In 16 and 17, we continued to uh, develop the system and we started some uh, small pilots and we began to train staff. And then 2017-2018, um, that is really the first year in which we had the system in place. But even though we had the system in place, we were still doing some um, continued training on student learning objectives, um, which is that student growth piece that's part of our evaluation. Last year, we added software to track um, our evaluation system. And then what happened was COVID happened. And COVID has really thrown a wrench into um, teacher evaluation, which I'll share a little bit later. There's key components of the evaluation system. There's standards for professional practice. Um, those need, needed to be in place in the system that we developed. We needed to ensure that there were multiple measures of um, to determine educator effectiveness. So it wasn't just what was happening inside the classroom um, with students. We also look at things at how they interact with colleagues at, during staff meetings, how they interact with parents and the community. Needed to have a rating scale um, with four levels of effectiveness. We needed to make sure that in our system, there was peer collaboration and support. And then there, there needed to be a process um, to use the evaluation system like I mentioned earlier, for professional development and making important employment decisions. So there's four parts to our system, and I'm gonna explain each one of these, these pieces in, part, in, in some greater detail. The first part is that professional practice. The second part is professional growth. What we know here in the, system, in the department is goal setting. There's a piece in, that involves student growth and then there's a piece of student perception and student surveys. So the professional practice piece. Professional practice, each um, job description in the department has specific standards that are specific to that job description. So if we look at a school counselor, a nurse, our Title I teachers, our librarians, all of these folks have their own standards that have been developed and that we hold them accountable for in the evaluation system. I'm gonna walk you through what the teacher standards look like um, as a way just to give you a flavor of what the system looks like. So as a teacher, we look at six different areas. Um, the six areas being planning and preparation, classroom management, delivery of instruction, assessment, family and community outreach, and those professional responsibilities. To give you a little bit more in detail, planning and preparation, what we're looking for there, does a teacher come with a plan every day um, that is geared towards engaging student, that presents content in a logical, sequential way, using the, the, the best practices that we know in the profession. Classroom management, looking at just do teachers have high expectations for students are they able to develop positive relationships do they support the social emotional learning of students when we look at delivering instruction do they have clear goals are they engaging students when we look at assessment do they have clear criteria of how they are assessing students are they able to tell when a student is having difficulty and respond appropriately when we look at family and community outreach, do they show respect to the various um, stakeholders um, they um, work with? Are they responsive to the parents and the students in which they work? And the last piece is a professional responsibility. We look at daily attendance. Do they come to school? Um, do they have great attendance? 
Um, we look, how do they collaborate in a staff meeting? Do they go above and beyond? Do they attend student sporting events outside of school? Do they attend PTA meetings? These are all things that we look at. Each one of those areas is broken down into sub areas. And just, just one example that I put in here in terms of planning and preparation. Um, and this is the area of knowledge, content area knowledge. And before we had talked about the four areas. So these are the four areas, highly effective, effective, improvement necessary, and does not meet the standard that teachers go through and they rate themselves on a variety of areas. Now there are 60 indicators that teachers evaluate themselves on. So it's pretty comprehensive. If we look at, so those are standards of practice um, that we look at. Teachers go through every year and they self-evaluate of where they see themselves. And then they go through a goal setting process. The goal setting process um, begins with that self-assessment. They look at what are those areas of strength and what are some areas of improvement that I need to work on as a professional? Once they go through that process, they identify an area that they wanna work on from their professional practice standards. Um, and then they set a goal. Sometimes there's one goal, sometimes there's two goals. Um, it depends on the individual. Sometimes as a department, we, we may say, everybody, we want you to set this district goal or this building goal, and then have a goal for yourself. Um, and so the, the, the number of goals may vary, but everybody goes to the process of setting that goal. And so they work, they work through those goals during the year. And at the end of the year, they review those goals. Um, some of them review them with a peer and some review with an administrator, depending on the cycle they're on. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little later on. So the professional practice plays a part. The goal setting piece pay, plays a part. And then we look at student growth. So this is probably the area um, in our uh, evaluation system currently, under law currently, that is the most difficult for our staff. Um, and that is the student learning objectives. Our teachers do tremendous work. Um, they are getting growth from students, but it's hard sometimes to quantify that growth. Um, so with the student learning objectives, once again, it's an annual process. Um, the teachers choose a common assessment, and by common assessment, I mean that's an assessment that's given across the department, across the grade level. Um, they have a pre-assessment they give to students to see how they do. Um, they look at that pre-assessment, they set a goal of where they want their kids to be. Um, that goal is approved by the administrator, then the teacher does their um, teaching, they do their work with students, and at the end, they do a uh, the student takes the assessment again, and what we call a post-assessment at the end of learning. And then the teachers develop, um, based on the goals they set, they see how much growth the students exhibited. Um, that's the student growth portion. Last and final portion of the system is called the student perception surveys or student surveys. And these are just some of the examples that are used in the surveys. Uh, questions, uh, teacher respects students in class, my teacher shows me how mistakes can help me learn. I feel safe in the classroom. My teacher explains what is being taught in each lesson. And I can talk to my teacher if I am upset about something. These are just some examples. Um, the surveys are given to students in grades 3 to 12. Um, there's anywhere from 25 to 30 questions on them. They're, survey, they're anonymous. Um, and teachers use these survey results to inform their own practice um, and they use it to inform their goal setting. And they, it is a conversation tool um, that is used during um, conferences with administrators um, with that. These surveys do not factor into the evaluation system um, where the first three components do. Um, these are just used to guide the work um, with goal setting. Now, as we look at um, our teacher evaluation system. I'm gonna get into detail a little bit more, dig deeper, but there's an important thing before we move forward. There's two types of teachers we have in our system. The first one types are probationary teachers. Those are teachers that are new to Sanford. Doesn't have to be a brand new teacher. 
uh, probationary teacher is someone that's new to Sanford. Um, for folks that were hired this past fall, hired in 2020, their probationary period is two years. And we had talked about that at a previous meeting. Um, and that is a state law. If teachers were hired in 2018 or 2019, they still fall under that three year probationary period. And then we have our continuing contract teachers. Those are teachers that um, have gone through their probationary period and they're with us. Um, the, what was I gonna say? I'll come back to it. I lost my train of thought there. So when we look at we, the amount of support, the amount of supervision, the evaluation cycle looks different from our probationary teachers than it does for our, our continuing contract teachers. Our probationary teachers, and I'm just gonna use a two-year cycle. During that first year, everyone is assigned a mentor. That is part of the law. We need to provide our teachers with mentors. And so every new teacher coming to our district has a mentor. Um, went too fast. Uh, they have that mentor. They are observed. Um, at least one of those observations um, is a full lesson observation where we see it from the beginning to the end. Um, and other than the full lesson observation, there's a mu multiple mini observations that are done, at least three to four walkthroughs per year. They do set a SMART goal. That SMART goal during this first year is done with their mentor. They do have that SLO, they do the student surveys, and three times a year, in November, February, and April, they have a formal evaluation that's written up where they meet with the administrator and they talk about, this is what you're doing well, this is what I wanna see as those next steps. And so there's several checkpoints, formalized checkpoints where they're receiving something in writing about how they're doing. At the end of year one, we make a determination, is this somebody that we want to have continue with us as a school system based on these evaluations? If they go on to year two, they could have a mentor. The, that is optional in year two. Um, and that decision is made by the administrator. If the administrator says, you know what, this teacher could use some more support, showing progress, but I think they need some more support, we will put a mentor in place for a second year. They go through the same evaluation cycle. Um, the same things that happened that first year, they're having three evaluations in November, February, and April. We're, we're watching a full lesson. We're doing some mini walkthroughs and providing feedback. And at that end of that second year, um, that's when we have to make the decision of whether or not we want to bring somebody on for a continuing contract. Um, during the first, these first two years, high level of support, both from administrators and from mentors, high level of supervision. And so we really, by the end of two years, I was an elementary principal. By the end of two years, I've had the opportunity to work, to work with a teacher, provide them with feedback. I can see, are they taking my feedback? Am I seeing growth? Um, are they connecting well with students? Are the, is there communication with parents good? These are questions we ask ourselves um, when it comes to the end of the two years, whether or not we want to have them continue with us. Uh, so I'll come circle back to that a little bit later. For our continuing evaluation cycle teachers, they're on a three-year evaluation cycle. This first year, I'm gonna go, the first year is, a, we'll call it the formal evaluation year. During that year, the administrator is doing three to four walkthroughs, um, providing them with feedback. The administrator is meeting with them to review their annual goals. They have that SLO, that student growth piece. The students are doing their surveys. But at the end of the year, um, when the springtime rolls around, you sit down with the teacher, review the evaluations that you've had over the past three years, um, you review the SMART goal, and it's really a time when they do a summative evaluation to say, this is how I see things are going. And um, then they move on to the next year. What's different between year one and year two? Year two, the administrator is still walk, doing walkthroughs, providing feedback. Um, during this year, they were meeting with their peer to review their goals and SLOs. Student surveys are still happening. They're still coming up with a summative rating, but it's not formalized with that administrator in, in um, being side by side. 
And then the same thing happens in year three. So a continuing cycle teacher, they have a three-year cycle. So every three years, they're getting that in-depth evaluation. Now there's three types of observations. I talked about there's formal observations. That's where you're sitting down, watching the whole lesson. Could range from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, you're really getting an in-depth look at a, a teacher's performance. Now, those could be unannounced or they could be announced, um, either or. Um, that's the formula of observation. There's also, we've moved the past uh, four or five years, we've moved to doing more of a walkthrough observation, which are unannounced, where over a short period of time, um, you get a quick snapshot of what student learning is looking like. Um, what the teacher's engagement is with students. Um, and over, the theory is if, you, if you're in a classroom often enough, you're gonna get a full picture of what's going on and when they're unannounced. The last part is informal. Um, what's really um, difficult um, at times in the evaluation system is capture of those things that happen outside of the classroom. And I can say what the law, what our new system has brought it's brought a um, bigger scope in what we're including in evaluations. Um, really, we're looking at how teachers are interacting in staff meetings, how they're interacting in parent meetings, what's their communication like, what's their attendance like. Um, these new rubrics are really much more uh, comprehensive when it comes to the evaluation cycle. End of the day, we have to give teachers a, a rating. Um, it's a four rating scale. I'm not going to read these for you word for word, but it's basically highly effective, effective, improvement necessary, and does not meet standard. Those are the four descriptors. Now, question is, if we have a continuing contract teacher um, who's doing, who's, we're happy with their performance, they're getting great student growth, great communication, their lessons are great, if they're effective, or highly effective um, after that evaluation, they're gonna end up on an individualized growth plan. And so that's what we had just talked about, that three-year cycle. They're gonna end up on that three-year cycle. Now, if we have somebody that after the evaluation by the administrator, they come out as ineffective, that first year that they are ineffective, the administrator is gonna pull them back close to them. They're going to set goals with them. They're going to be um, doing a more in-depth observation. They're going to be going through and doing a formal evaluation during that year um, to try to get them up, back up where they need to be effective um, or highly effective. This, we see there are times when we have this monitored growth plan happening um, where a teacher for whatever reason um, is just falling off the mark a little bit and that happens. But usually we, we, we are transparent with the teacher say, we, you know, we have a concern about this. We'd like you to work on this. Um, and with support through our coaches we have, um, through the administrators, you know, our goal is to get them back up into that effective rate. Now, if we have somebody that's on ineffective for two years, um, that's where um, it's a highly more, it's where they come up, basically go on a corrective action plan. Um, and that's where central office um, gets involved, meaning uh, the superintendent or the assistant superintendent. It's where we are have set clear goals with the teacher. Teacher has frequent observations. Um, we meet um, as a central office with the teacher and oftentimes a union. And we go through and we work uh, to improve the teacher's performance. If we get to a point where after two years and they're still ineffective, then we, um, that's when we can recommend non-renewal um, or a teacher can decide to um, resign. Now that continuing contract decision that I talked about earlier, um, we really have to pay attention to that. Um, at the end of two years or at the end of three years we're at now, is this someone that um, we want to be married to as a school system? Because in a way, it's a marriage. Um, is it a good fit? Um, because it's much more difficult to get rid of somebody that's on a continuing contract than it is a probationary teacher. 
So we want to make sure the people we have are quality and that they're doing right by our kids. Um, you know, overall, I'd say just the system is built on growth. It's built on support um, to really uh, support our teachers in growth. That's what it's all about. Now with COVID-19, uh, it really did throw a wrench into the teaching profession. Teachers have been asked to do things that they've never done before. There was a tremendous amount of growth that had to happen. Um, and so the main department of education did um, send out some guidance to districts and they really asked us to focus on supporting our staff with SEL, their own social emotional well-being, and supporting them with the new instructional practices that they have, uh, that they encountered. Um, Zoom technology, um, Seesaw, Google Classroom, you know, they asked us to support our staff and pay attention to the social emotional well-being. And with that being said, um, we did take student learning objectives off the table uh, for our staff because we had to take something off the plate. Um, and so that was taken off the plate this year. Um, the one thing that is still in place is that probationary timeline. So our, for our new folks, um, we have we have still have to um, make sure that we're following that timeline. Um, some updates to the law. It just seems like we got the, the system in place and there were some changes to the law. Um, under the new law, the SLO piece, the student learning and growth measures uh, are no longer required starting in September. Um, and that is, we'll be coming back to you later, in sep later um, this spring with our recommendations from our committee, uh, but that is no longer a requirement in our system moving forward. The second piece, we do have a PEPG steering committee that meets once or twice a year. And that committee needs to be made up of the majority need to be teachers. And the union needs to have a say in who those teachers are in the bargaining unit. Um, we have a really good relationship with our teachers union and they were it, created the system with us um, all along the way. Um, and we are in a pretty good spot with that in terms of our representative currently. The law also states that any changes we make to our system needs to be reached by consensus. And that's a, a new piece. Um, and so we can say consensus, there's administrators, there's teachers, there's representatives from the union on there. So it really is a group, um, group decision making when it comes to that. So this is a lot of information um, to a very complex system. Um, I think that um, it's a very comprehensive system, and I think that it's one that really focuses on growth, um, but at the same time, it, um, it does hold staff uh, accountable. And at this time, I'll take questions, if you have any. Questions from anybody? Well, I'll start out by uh, thanking you for the uh, presentation, Steve. That was very thorough. Um, and I think it's good, because I think there is a little bit of a public perception that once a teacher's in there and tenured, that they can do whatever they want and you know, you're not gonna get rid of them. Um, so I think this is good to hold them to an accountability level professionally, but it sounds like it's in a way that's really encouraging them to grow and you know, just become better teachers. So it sounds great. Everything just went through, so. Yeah, Don, and I will say, um, really the teacher profession is, is really about supporting um, teachers through professional growth. Um, you know, they participate in professional development as a department. We offer uh, professional development uh, on Wednesdays during the summer. So there's a lot of opportunities for professional growth. Um, so teachers should feel supported. Um, we also have coaches, instructional coaches that are in, we have a behavior coach, a literacy coach, a math coach. So we do have instructional coaches that are also there um, supporting our, our staff. And then our administrators, they play a big role um, in supporting staff in, in um, getting them to grow and where they want them to be. And I think sometimes um, people forget that administrators are not only uh, the, the, the evaluator, but they oftentimes administrators uh, play that coach role too um, to support our teachers, so. That's great, thanks. Amy, anything has a question or comment? I do. Um, thank you so much, Steve. That was awesome. Um, 
uh, the peer review process is like something that's near and dear to my heart because I certainly spend uh, a lot of my time for my job um, as I'm in charge of that for all the staff for my unit. And, you know, one thing that um, that I do know is about giving feedback is, is, a, is an art, right? So it's a talent. Some are great at it and some are not. And I, and I you know, um, I wonder if... All uh, like when you're saying when I what I think I heard you say is that primarily probably the um, the building principles are kind of um, leading giving the feedback, but then I'm also seeing that like there's some years that it's like kind of a peer to peer feedback. I'm not sure if I'm right about that. And the reason why I ask that is has um, all the building principals and the peers that give each other feedback, have they been ever like gone to a class on kind of how to do that? Um, because, you know, what I've learned in my own workforce is that sometimes people kind of skate around, but we're not really always kind of getting to it. That could be really helpful and valuable feedback. I think, um... Amy, to respond to your question, our administrators, um, as part of their training as administrators, they take a supervision and evaluation class in which they really work on giving feedback. Um, our mentors, they all go through a mentor training where they learn how to give feedback. I think that it is also something that we continue to provide um, professional development for our administrators on. Um, last year, we had worked with a, a consultant to to work on giving feed, feedback in terms of student engagement. Um, so there are ongoing opportunities in, um, that we work with staff. I think the one area, Amy, where I don't think as a department we spent a lot of time on is how to help teachers provide individual feedback to other teachers um, if they are not mentors. Um, I think that's an area of need um, where once we get back out of this COVID, COVID uh, mess, um, I think that that's an area where we could spend some more time on. Um, I also think, Amy, in terms of this evaluation system, I think what I presented tonight is um, what it should look like. And I think there's spots in, in our system where you're gonna find where it's um, working very, very well. And I think you're going to find there's parts where we need to, to beef it up a little bit. And I think that's part of it is because the, the system is new. Um, you know, we were just getting in a roll and then COVID hit. And so um, it's a work in progress. I think I just want to make sure that, it, that that comes across too. It's a work in progress in terms of our ongoing um, training, development, support um, with that. Amy, I just want to add in, uh, as Steve mentioned, one thing that we try to do is it's ongoing for us as part of our A-team meetings as administrators. We will come in and work on trying to make sure that what we all see, there's some alignment and consistency to that. And so those will be things where, as Steve talked about, for example, we'll have focus areas on engagement. What does engagement look like? And more importantly, what is some of the feedback we can be offering that either honors that or also helps for those areas to improve? So that's something that we have to ongo is ongoing at our level to make sure that that's just, you know, not something that is assumed. Uh, we have to be able to kind of keep that. Um, that's, that's ongoing work for us at the administrator level. And, you know, I guess I'm asking as a parent right now, you know, my, you know, having five um, children and, you know, them being in various grades and, you know, various schools, you know, when I have, if I want to, if I want to, I, I send the teachers like, oh my God, you're doing an amazing job. And should I, should parents that are listening right now, when they have, you know, this, this feedback you know, should we be sending it to just the staff or should we be sending it to the principals as well so that it can go in their, you know, yearly evaluation of like, you know, how amazing they were doing and above and beyond and all that, just so that there's a little bit more parent feedback? Um, or is the hope in the future for 
feedback to be given, um, you know, like a survey or whatnot to the individual classroom parents for, you know, um, the kids. I think especially if right now, I mean, teachers are doing such an amazing job and I feel like, you know, I think we all need to do a better job at letting them know how amazing they are, um, you know, I think Amy is a building principal, um, and now in my role as assistant superintendent, I enjoy um, getting a positive feedback about staff. Um, the emails I receive just confirm the good things I already know about many of our staff, um, that they're doing tremendous. Um, so I think if parents had any positive comments that they wanted to send along, I think including the administrator is a, is a great thing. Um, Oftentimes we hear only the, when there are issues or challenges. And so if parents did have positive comments, I think the administrator would be very welcome to that. Great, anything else, Amy? I guess, if, yes I do, one more. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> you know, you were saying before that, you know, when you had started in 2017 and all those, when you know, the laws had changed and you guys were meeting as a committee. Um, and I don't know if, if anybody here is on that committee, but I certainly would um, would love to join in on that conversation and, and those committee work. I'm not mistaken, Amy. I, was, I went to some of those early meetings and it, 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 the language that is pretty explicit that school committee members input is not directly. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought he mentioned that. That's why there, there were. I, I went to some meetings until I realized that really, um, well, it wasn't for us to be at. Okay, gotcha. Steve, is that correct? I think when you get into the nitty gritty of it, um, when we were looking to put the system in place and talking about what the standards of good teaching were, and you know, and we have a meeting for two hours, um, and for a while there, we were meeting every other week. It seemed. Um, yes. I, I think it was not a good use of the, the time. And so I think we, we kept the um, com, uh, school committee informed and the, and the members informed. And when it came time for approval, um, it went before the board, so. Yeah, and kudos, kudos to Steve and his presentation tonight because you'll notice there it was a little bit light on the jargon and that wasn't by accident, that was by design. Kudos to Steve to make sure that this was done in a way that could be able to not talk shop that we sometimes often do, that sometimes um, the public won't understand. Public, we don't understand it half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to Steve, I not use the word cohort once. <laughs> uh, should we start playing school committee bingo when we have all the time? <laughs> Whoever wins. <laughs> Uh, okay, any other questions for Steve? No, thank you. No, Steve. Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank Good you. work yeah, as I'm always. Steve, thank you. Okay, so now we'll move on to Cheryl. Looks like we have a CRF CARES ESSER no, update. Al alphabet update. Yeah. Alphabet <laughs> update. So uh, I was trying to figure out what to go through and what not to go through. So I figured um, uh, there's been some changes that happened in, in the um, beginning of January that has made us, you know, look at things a little bit and so move some things around. Um, so I figured I'd go through each one, explain some of the changes that have happened and how much of it we've spent. Um, so the CARES Fund, which was the first care, first act that got approved, um, which is the 923,000. We've only spent 10% of that. We were holding that bucket because we knew that we would have um, um, that bunch of the other ones were going to end and we were going to need that money to cover items that um, we were waiting on buying or um, staffing and stuff like that. But thankfully, we've been able to use some of the other money because it got extended. So you have the CRF1. Two, one and two, um, that all are got extended. So all of those went from having an end date of December 30th to end date of this June 30th, which was good because we had a couple projects we weren't going to be able to do, mostly due to timing, um, which is a good example is the one is the um, vestibule on, at CJL. We just would never get that 
done before December. Um, so in, I was actually in contact with um, DOE because I knew there were a couple invoices that weren't going to be in in time um, because we have, well, about $200,000 worth of computers that are still in limbo somewhere um, that we're waiting to get. So we had a couple items like that that we're waiting on. Um, so CRF1 has almost all been spent. There's very little bit that hasn't been spent. Um, the ones that haven't been spent were some of the um, um, ventilation. We didn't have to use as much as we need. We had, and um, some of it's also for the special ed um, uh, outplacement too. That we have money sitting there to cover some of that. Um, Adult Ed, we got money from them for them for about thirteen thousand. Most of that's been spent. Um, CRF two, um, about sixty-two percent of that. That's where those computers I was talking about that we're waiting for, and the vestibule are, and so that's where those are. Um, there was the reallocation of money, which was one hundred thirty-five thousand. Um, that's just about spent um, as of today. I just looked it up. Um, we had one of the big items that was back ordered actually show up this week. Um, and then uh, the day programming, which Steve has been a great, been doing a great deal of, 56% um, of that's been spent. But the reason why that's so low is that um, a port, we actually had lowered it because the city was paying for a portion of it and we were paying a portion, but they gave us all that money back so that we could extend the program through the end of the year. So that money will get spent. It's just we're waiting um, because they extended it and gave us a bunch of our money, um, gave it back to us so that we could actually utilize it. So that was great. Um, and that was about $39,000 that they gave back to us um, based on that reallocation. And then we have the SO2 funds, which we were talking about in the last meeting, which none of that's been spent. Um, that one's, we're still creating all the programs and stuff that we're gonna have to build to um, apply and create to be able to use those funds. Um, the PPE, um, a lot of that's been used up throughout all the system, um, especially after um, today, we just bought a bunch more desks and chairs. Um, so that's using up pretty much the remainder that I had sitting there um, for the most part. Um, there's still some extra there. Um, we still had some left in the CARES fund too. So that still has some um, supplies left in it. But for the most part, we've expended most of the stuff. Um, we're either waiting for it to be implemented or waiting for the invoice. Um, we didn't pressure people since we actually got the extra time. Otherwise, I would have been knocking on some doors to try to get that money in um, or that invoice in, but might as well utilize while we can. Um, so that's in general what's going on with the CARES funds. It's um, a lot of um, just making sure we can utilize it the best to our advantage um, with the changes. Seeming it changes every day, it seems like they'll make a change to it and then you have to, you know, relook at things and maybe move things around accordingly. So that's been a good portion of what we've tried to do is because we want to try to utilize that money the best way that we can um, uh, create that. Um, the CARES Fund also included $11,700 for our St. Thomas and they've spent their whole money. Um, so we're good there. Um, Cause I know that was a, um, one of the items that got talked about early day, in the early days of CARES Fund. Um, so if you have any questions, I could try to answer them. <laughs> any so, questions for Cheryl? Yeah, Cheryl, um, earlier Matt was talking about um, WSSR TV, I think, and uh, Metrocast for the city. Is there uh, any of the ESSER funds or funds in general available for educational communication? Yeah, we do have a section of communication. Um, a lot of it's been spent because um, you have to create a program around it. And we didn't do anything um, really regarding um, TV, except we could use some of the staffing if we decided to do that. Um, because we still have that. 
portion of it. Um, but we bought signs, communication signs that are getting installed at the MCS, CJL, and CES that are going to help with communication. Um, we just couldn't install them all the way because um, couldn't dig a hole after a certain time period in Maine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Carol, on your, on your priority for additional positions, items to consider with ESSER funds. Yep. <clears throat> Can you put the letters WSSR TV under that list? You want me to put it? Yep. I will um, add that. I have like an ongoing list of things that people notify, um, mention. And so to make sure we have the conversation again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We also had that conversation on the steering committee as well, and also kind of the uh, the, the city side of stuff as well, whether there's some yep. stuff on that. We can you kind of come together. Some matching funds there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Definitely on the uh, on the, uh, yeah. the biggest. The, public, that's really all we need. The yeah. biggest Thanks. piece. The biggest piece with that will be you can't really replace items. Um, that's the biggest piece. So if you're enhancing the communication in a way because of COVID, it has to be because of COVID, which I'm thinking uh, some of the stuff I was, you know, thinking out loud, um, you know, the gaming, the games being broadcast, if it was charged to that, you would think that could be done by COVID money. So because that would not have happened if it wasn't for COVID. Well, this, look, this, the setup of this room right. is, yeah. is for that reason. Yeah. So We have done a lot of that stuff, the setting up of rooms. Um, Joan has been great. We've done a ton of stuff through um, COVID money. I mean, we did $1.5 billion worth of computers and electronics and Promethean boards and stuff like that. Um, the owls were a big purchase. Um, those were all done with these funds. Excellent. Anything else for Cheryl? Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, we're gonna move on to new business. So Matt, looks like we've got a bunch of uh, COVID-19 related uh, things here. Sure, so um, the FFCRA expired back on December 31st, 2020, uh, but um, the president did sign, President Trump did sign a package on December 27th. As part of that extension, it didn't require a mandate, any extension to the FFCRA, uh, but as we've done, we uh, have uh, made the decision to provide uh, certain uh, benefits voluntarily during COVID-19. And so what we've been doing is rather than giving that a blanket deadline, we made the decision to go ahead and uh, approve these on a month to month basis. So this is the uh, second meeting in February. And so um, on a month to month basis, we're looking for the school committee to approve this for another month. Our next monthly review will take place at our second meeting in March which is March 15th uh, with that. So this is uh, the first item uh, that is uh, under that is um, sick leave benefits. Uh, and then number two is the sick leave bank uh, that we've established in um, collaboration with our union. And also the third one would be the compensation schedule that we're using to also with uh, the Corona relief funds to continue to help us be able to do that. So I'll take any questions. This is just a, as I said, this is a, gonna be a um, monthly agenda item under new business for us to extend these. Hi, right. question. I'd, I'd make a motion to <clears throat> approve all three. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify that like this, there's no changes to this from when we originally put it in. It's just uh, we're going month to month. Uh, that was more just kind of a funding thing, right, Matt? If I jog my memory, why we're not just doing it for a length of time? We're just doing month to month. Well, it really has to do with COVID nineteen. So we're kind of just waiting for the COVID nineteen. I think it's a, a, a positive gesture. 
just bad. Yeah. No, we're going, we're doing it month to month just yeah, because it, of the uncertainty. It, 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 it's correct. Rather than put a date on the end, that will allow, allow us to continue to evaluate as it goes along. And so, um, Cheryl, I don't know. Do you have any update on how some of these have been used uh, to date just so that uh, uh, we have that information? Um, so since I didn't have like um, beginning of, I just have from the beginning of time till now, the expanded COVID days, we, we spent out about 327 days worth um, that are COVID related. Um, so either childcare, ourself um, and that does go back to March um, just so you know that um, and then um, I didn't include the regular FML days because those would happen no matter what so out of just the COVID related expanded days it's 327 days yeah, now like, like Jonathan alluded to it's really it's the right thing to do for the employees I agree. that's why we're going to play this to begin with um, so we can make an official motion to accept the three. Okay. In that wording. Okay. <laughs> I'll second that. Um, any, further, like just, go ahead discuss it now. <laughs> any further discussion from anybody? Uh, okay. Uh, all in favor? All in favor. Those three are all set, Matt. Uh, so that would bring us to Cheryl with the January 21 financials. Yeah. Okay. So January financials. So the first page, which is um so the reconciliation part um the general education and adult education revenues are about 2.9 million dollars and with 2. Point, uh 20 uh, okay i said that wrong 25.9 million dollars and uh 29.3 million dollars in expenses for a net expense of 3.4 million um that's mostly due to subsidy um you know, the timing of it um, there's 28 special revenue accounts currently that are that have activity. Um, so there's probably more than that if you add in ones that have balances. Um, but we have $4.2 million worth of revenue and $6.2 million worth of expenses. A good portion of that is your CRF and CARES funds that we were talking about, because you pay it first and then you get it reimbursed. And the same thing with titles, which is our, our other large amounts. So that's why it's um, a net expense, not a net revenue. Um, of course, we have capital funds, which um, of course don't have as much revenues because that's uh, just in interest income or movement of money between the two bondings. Um, we have $1.2 million of revenue and we have expenses of 8.3 million for $7.1 million total, uh, net expense. Um, we have three enterprise funds for a total of $0.4 million in revenues and $0.6 million in expenses for a net of $0.2 million in expense. And then we have trust funds, which are $53,000 in revenue and $31,000 in expenses for a net revenue of $22,000. If you go to the second page, um, this is where we look at it in the ways we actually um, keep track of things. Uh, the first way is we keep track of the different types of categories or account groupings. For salaries and benefits, the schools have spent $15.2 million. It's an increase of only $4,000. It's um, $4,000 less than the prior year, more than the prior year. Um, and uh, for the next set of categories, which is the purchase professional and technical services of 1.2 million, purchase services of 267,000, other purchase services of 1.6 million, supplies and energy of 923,000, and property maintenance of 175,000. So if you total all those up, um, we are about $54,000 higher than the prior year, which is not a lot of money when you think of how much money that is. And of course, with the debts, dues, fees, and miscellaneous, we're at $9.7 million of expense. Um, and a lot of that money is comes back in as revenue from the DOE. And then for the bottom section category, which is how we actually pass our budgets, which is using the articles, 
um, if you classify the direct, in, direct instruction, which are articles one through four, we spent $12.6 million. And articles five through seven, which is your staff support, student and staff support, um, it contributes 3.6 million. Article eight, which is your transportation is 0.9 million. Uh, our article nine, which is your facilities management and CIP is 2.4 million. Our debt, of course, is at 9.4 million. And Article 11, which is um, contributes $27,000, which is PAC, and adult education is 0.3 million. So it's a total of 29, three, $29,322,644 year to date. And the expenses are about 127,000 above last year which you think most of that is probably salaries and benefits. Our revenues are at $1.1 million above last year, mostly on the subsidy being $1.2 million above last year's. Adult education revenue is 8,000 above last year, which is uh, due to the sharing of the director of adult education with its SAD 60. And that is what I have for financials. Any questions? Excellent. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the 131-21 expenses and reconciliation as presented. Um, second? Second. Second from Mr. Rue. Any discussion? Anybody? Yeah, Cheryl, normally we sign a bunch of warrants. Am I, I mean, it's not like I, I need to do that today, but do, are we behind on those or am I just forgetful? Nope. Um, so what um, they, the city passed an emergency um, ordinance that made it so that the treasurer is signing them instead of all of the school department and the, the um, city council because of everybody doing Zooming versus in person, that it was going to make it too difficult to get all the signatures. I still do it. got a big packet. Yeah, I thought Don't worry. <laughs> it's coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> Okay, I like it the way it is. This is good. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, Paul and Amy have an experience that uh, we're just yeah, a little pack yeah, that goes yeah. around and you just sign it. You don't read it. You just sign it. <laughs> it's funny I was thinking that. about that today. <laughs> Very thoroughly before I sign anything. Okay, um, any more discussion? All in favor? All in favor. Thanks, Cheryl. You're welcome. Okay, old business, we have none. Uh, resignations, Mr. Nelson, it looks like we have a few here. Yeah, two of our COVID subs, uh, they resigned uh, back in January. Um, with that, we also have two staff appointments. Uh, one of those, uh, two of those will be COVID uh, subs uh, for that. And then we've also uh, replaced the school year administrative assistant at the middle school uh, that um, resigned earlier. Gotcha. Yep, we see that. Welcome aboard. Uh, looks like we got some staff transfers. Yes. Uh, Bridget Adams is going from Carl J. Lamb, a kindergarten literacy ed tech. She's stepping in to be a long term substitute kindergarten teacher, Carl J. Lamb. Very, very grateful for that. Um, she, she's doing an excellent job. And then also uh, one of our COVID uh, subs, we did, uh, we're transferring him over to a second shift custodian position at Sanford Middle School um, back at the beginning of February. Excellent. Um, so that's good. Uh, staff nominations, I see none. Policies, I see none. Um, items for a future agenda. Anything anybody wants to throw out there other than the stuff we already have listed? Well, I'll just let people, I'll let people know that next Monday, uh, March 1st, we will get another, uh, continue to get a COVID-19 uh, return to in-person update. We're also going to take action on the budget that we can, um, propose budget that we can pass on to the school committee. Uh, there will also be the elementary school naming. And then we also have a, um, there'll be a presentation um, uh, for our NWA data from Beth Lambert. And we also have another uh, recommendation from the Legacy Foundation for some other naming opportunities that will also be part of next week's agenda. 
Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, John, uh, Jessica, you're all good? Yep. Anything, anybody else? No? Okay, so then uh, we've got some calendar announcements. Um, Tuesday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. is the uh, SRTC Virtual Admissions Open House. Uh, Wednesday, we did have a budget workshop scheduled, but I believe we will be canceling that. Uh, yeah. Next Monday, on the 1st, a safety committee meeting. Uh, there's a performing arts committee meeting at 3 p.m. on Monday. Um, we had a budget workshop scheduled for prior to the regular meeting next week, but that will, I believe, be canceled as well. Uh, so we have a regular meeting, um, 6 p.m. next Monday. Uh, Matt just went over some of the agenda items. Uh, and then the budget committee starts meeting uh, that following Thursday the 4th, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, that's via Zoom. Uh, there's a wellness committee meeting on March 8th. Uh, budget committee uh, is every Thursday through March, so the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, then our second meeting for March is the 15th. Uh, that'll be a regular meeting at 6. Uh, WSSR TV uh, steering committee will be the 17th, and I promise I'll get that one together this month. <laughs> Um, and then we have the SRTC Advisory Committee meeting on the 19th, Friday at 9 a.m. Anything you'd like to add to that, uh, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, I'd like to correct an error. Um, we did move the um, uh, Performing Arts Center Advisory Committee meetings from the first Monday of the month to the second Tuesday. So that we haven't updated that on our Google Doc that we took these through. So my apologies by not catching that, but that is not on March 1st. Gotcha, I thought maybe I read something wrong there. No, that was all us, sorry. Okay, um, so if anybody has any other thing they'd like to announce calendar-wise? No? Okay, then I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. It's a So moved. Who wants to second it? No follow wants to second. Any discussion? All in favor? We are officially adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.